Um, thanks for joining our talk. This is Game On, adding privacy to threat modeling. I'm uh, Mark Vinkovic. I work at LogMain as a manager for application security. I'm coming from the Budapest office, so if you're interested in what Oracle Clown on the other side of the planet is doing, I'm also happy to talk about that one. <laughs> but um, apart from that, I used to work a lot in user-centered design and usable security. I also have been running the Security Champion program at Longmain and building that up, so if that's something you're interested in. And also for a couple of years now, uh, privacy has become one of my passions, not just the legal side of it, of oh my god, fines, but actually I think it's a very fun and interesting technical challenge. So that's how I ended up adding privacy to the Stride model and the elevation of privilege cards. Hi, I'm Adam Shostak. I helped create the CVE. I'm on the review board at Black Hat. I've written a couple of books. And most relevant to this talk, I created the Elevation of Privilege game to teach people how to threat model and help them do so. And so we'll be talking about how that's evolved over time. So just to get a feeling of who is how familiar with this, who knows Elevation of Privilege card game? Okay, who has ever tried it out? Who is actively using it? Okay, no problem. <laughs> 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 Great, so um, we're just going to give a quick overview of the ratio of privilege card games so you know what we're talking about. Then Adam is going to go a little bit deeper into why games are good, not just for threat modeling, but for security in general in other areas. And then I'm going to talk about um, how uh, I came up with the idea or what the motivation was to add privacy to this and then what the methodology has been to do this so that at the end we'll end up with Striped, which is um, adding privacy to it, and we'll have a small game, but uh, we come to that later. So as a start, uh, let's look at Strap modeling. So uh, you don't have to read this. This is the Strap model for SSL. But just from the picture, if you look at it, like this is something that we appreciate. Like This is a well-made Strap model. It covers a lot of areas, so compared to TLS covering a quite small use case, it has a very comprehensive and nice to make strap model. And I think we also agree here that doing strap modeling as part of your um, application security program or in general security program is a really good thing to do. And we motivate people to do this. What we are not that good at is that if someone starts freshly as a security engineer, like what's our advice to how he should start this? And the usual advice is going to be, well, just do brainstorming. Well, academia has quite good definition of what modeling is, and they weren't thinking about brainstorming when they came up with that definition. So just saying them do brainstorming is not really going to help them get uh, practice in this. So there's a second piece of advice, which is a bit more methodological, is look at all your assets and think of all the ways something could go wrong. Now again, that's exactly what their problem is. They have no clue what all the ways are, what something, uh, in uh, something could go wrong. So they could start looking at like threat libraries or threat catalogs, but those are huge. Like doing those as a regular exercise really works only if you have that amount of time to do threat modeling. And some, goes to the, some go to the extreme saying that, well, security professionals just look at a system and they know all the problems. They don't have any kind of methodology, they know it. So if that's how you work, and you are being appreciated less than Professor X, then you should talk about that with your manager. And, and I just want to add that I'm proud of the threat modeling book that I wrote, and it's 600 pages. It's not something you give to a beginner and say, read this and then get started. It's way too much. Yeah. So. Um, so when I think about threat modeling, and when I think about threat modeling with experts in the room, we're engaged, we're having a good time, we're playful in our exploration of ideas. And when someone is new to something, they, they find it challenging. There's a learning curve that they go through. And so when I started thinking about the gap between how I threat modeled and how people using the Microsoft threat modeling tool threat modeled, there was a real difference, and I was responsible for that tool, so I'm casting shade on myself, not anyone else. Um, and there's a, there's a model from positive psychology, which, and I'm just gonna step over this way to make it a little bit more 
visible for people on this side of the room. And that is when there's a balance between the skill and the challenge that it's applied to, people develop this feeling of flow, that they're engaged, that they're enjoying, that they're productive. And when we go from point A to point B, we go from a low challenge to a higher challenge without a corresponding increase in skill, people develop anxiety. On the other hand, if you go from point A to point C, your skill increases and challenge doesn't increase at the same time, you get bored. And so we need to build this balance between skill and challenge. And you'll see this in video games. When you start a new video game, there's a training level in which they're explicitly and intentionally taking you through this challenge. Walk to the door, open the door, pick up the kit, do this thing with the kit. You're developing these skills in a low challenge environment. Then a monster might show up. And so this approach can be used as we engineer and design systems of teaching, design systems to bring people new skills. And so when I think about threat modeling, I think about four key questions. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? And did we do a good job? And so there's lots of ways to answer each of these questions, ranging from what are we working on? Um, might be a whiteboard diagram, it might be something very fancy. What can go wrong? Different ways to answer the questions. And so as we get into elevation of privilege, and elevation of privilege was, in, was created to be the easy way to learn how to threat model, we start with something super simple, like a whiteboard diagram. And in software, we draw diagrams like this all the time. And so that's what you do to get started with elevation of privilege, is you draw a picture. And then what you do is, actually, I think this is you. Well, you sit down and play the elevation of privilege card game. Yes. <laughs> so who do you play with? Um, our experience, at least the way that uh, we apply this in LogMeIn, that having like five to six engineers in the room together with someone from the security team is like the best way to um, have a good uh, pace at which you are working. Obviously, involve uh, quality engineers, and very rarely you get the chance to have a product manager in there, which is always a fun experience how that works out. So you get these people into the room, and you hand out uh, the cards, and you explain that this is actually just as a regular card game but like any other, only that the suits are replaced with elements from the Stryl model. And the basic rule is that there is a calling card, and after that, everyone should stay in suit. Um, we're going to show that whenever you're playing a card, you should read out what's written on the card and work with that. And you play until you have time or you run out of cards. And very importantly, you also should appoint someone to take notes. Um, hopefully someone who is familiar enough with the system that the notes he's going to take are going to be understandable for the people in the room later on. So, we have here a simple little diagram, and um, when I created some of the animations for this deck 10 years ago, this was part of one of our training exercises. So it's an integrity monitoring system like Tripwire. So we've got some software out on hosts, we've got some software at a console, which keeps track of what's going on, what files are being changed, what our expectations are. And so we can have a model like this and use it as we play Elevation of Privilege. So, for example, Alice might play a card, the Three of Tampering. In a t and the card, which is a little small there, says, an attacker can take advantage of your custom key exchange or integrity control, which you built instead of using standard crypto. Now, as security people, we know that's something that you don't want to do. But if Alice is a software engineer or a network engineer, she might not have that knowledge. But the hint is on the card in front of her, and she can say, oh, maybe that applies to this network connection right here. So uh, next one up 
is Bob. So he has a really strong hand, and he plays the 10 of tampering, which says that an attacker can alter information in your information store, just with a little longer text. Um, so think about it. He says, well, there's a file store um, on the integrity checker console side. So if we have weak ACLs there, then someone might alter your configurations or alter the way the software works. So Charlie might play the five of tampering. An attacker can replay data because your code doesn't have timestamps or sequence numbers. And looking at the diagram, he might say that applies to this integrity data flow that comes back. And then finally, uh, Lisa plays the eight of tampering, saying an attacker can manipulate data because there's no integrity protection for data on the network. Now, very often, the answer to this is, well, we're using TLS. But just as often, like people don't know the difference between having encryption and uh, doing integrity checking. So what Lisa says is that, well, there's a connection there which uh, might have this problem. So the, rule, the, the card game derives from spades if you play a lot of card games. So you have to play in suit. The high card wins the hand unless someone plays the trump, a trump card. And a trump is the suit that always wins. So elevation of privilege is the trump, trump suit, excuse me. Um, there's, a, there's a mechanism for the game, which is there are aces. And an ace is you've invented a new threat that's not in the deck. And to support that, there are cards in the deck that say, here's a list of all the threats that you might see on all the cards. And then you give out some points. You give one point for each threat. You give one for winning the hand. And, you know, some people play this competitively and do a better job of tracking points than threats. That's a mistake. Um, but some people, some people like to know who's winning. Some people play very collaboratively. The idea, the key, is that you're actually engaging with the threats and the possibilities and having a conversation about the second question at the heart of threat modeling, which is what can go wrong? So as said, you play until you have cards or you run out of time, which is the latter is more often. Um, you count the points just also to get an indication like how did the uh, game go, how many items did you find, and to do a little bit of reinforcement for those people who did win. So what we did at LogMeIn previously was that the manager always bought a six pack for the person winning the game. But as the company grew, we are not allowed or not motivated anymore to drink beer during working hours. <laughs> so security engineering now has a bag of swags, basically, with scotch in it. Now, um, <laughs> with, <laughs> with swags, with, uh, we hand out to the winners. Now, very importantly also, after the session, make sure that you triage the items. You talk with your product managers, like, OK, how important are the items um, from his business perspective? and then make sure that those which uh, should be handled actually get into the ticketing system and are tracked them. Now, just listening to this, if you have never tried it out, and I really uh, motivate everyone to try it out, this sounds strange. Like, threat modeling, it's a beautiful art that experienced security engineers are doing. So why are you doing a game out of this? And it cannot work. Like, people are going to focus on very bad aspects of the session. They are going to focus on playing the high cards and so on, and you lose the whole idea. Now, those arguments might be true, but the experience is that it works. So we have uh, made regular uh, strap modeling a practice for more than two years now, and we always use the elevation of privilege card game. And there's always two, three high findings in every strap modeling session, which comes out by playing those cards, which have not been discovered before or have not been basically uh, explicitly called out. Now, one of my favorite uh, findings is, and I'd uh, like to share that with you. So there was a component written a couple of years ago. Um, the job of it was quite simple. The idea was that an admin can upload a file or a patch um, he wants to distribute in the network he is the admin of. And he uploads the file. He provides us the URL where this file can be found. And then our component picks up the file and distributes it in their system. So thinking about this, the engineers were also like, well, there's not a really high risk here, because the admin who wants to distribute 
the file is already the admin of the network. He's a local admin on all the machines. Like, there's not much which can go wrong here. Also, the software has been developed by some of the demigods of the company, like the ones who have been working for 20 years. And I've been still quite fresh. So I was like, oh my god, how am I supposed to tell them um, what could go wrong? Like, they certainly thought of all the things. So as we went through the session, there was, as I said, this one part that the admin provides us the URL of the file we should be distributing. And when we were talking about the validation of that URL, we were like, well, there's not much we can validate for because it's a file in the customer's network. He might be providing an IP address, which is only visible for him, or an S3 bucket, or uploading something to their own domain. Like, what do you want to validate against? Now, as it turned out, there was one important piece of validation which was missing which is it shouldn't point to our internal network. Because basically, the component was running an OR uh, firewall segment. So if you provided like an internal IP address, we would just be picking up a file from our internal network and send it out to his computers. So we discovered a quite nice way to use the component to extract data. Why I like this one really much is this whole story around it. Like These were principal fellow level engineers um, they were really security sensitive. So two of them were security champions for a long time. And before that, they have been writing uh, some of the sensitive piece of code in the company. But still, there was like one quite critical part of validation that they forgot. And uh, that came out with the elevation privilege card game. So more generally than elevation of privilege, I've I've come to the understanding that games are really good for security. That the, the things which games enable help us solve important problems which we face. And there's a bunch of reasons that games work as a tool. So, you know, if I bring out a box like this, and this is a very modern Sort of, and I'm going to have difficulty opening. Could I get you to open this? Thank you. I don't want to rip it or something. So games are attractive. They're, they're intriguing. Um, if, I start, if I start with some cards and I show these to you, it's like, oh, that's interesting, right? What is that? Let me learn about this. And that's powerful as we're engaging with developers who might think, that they have other things to do. It's powerful as we engage with operations people who might have other things to do. I talked about flow. Flow is important. You saw me get into a little bit of a flow state as I was talking about those things and I forgot to hand off to Mark. Um, the other thing that it does is if I'm going to hand, each of us has a hand of cards, as play progresses around the table, I cannot be a wallflower. I've got this card in my hand, and I've got to say, huh, how does this connect to the system? Not sure, I'll go to my next card, I'll go to my next card. And so it requires participation without being aggressive or demanding. It's the social milieu of, oh, it's your turn, please play. And if people are feeling a little frozen, and I see this happen, they'll say, you know, I think this card might have something to do with what we're working on, but I'm not exactly sure. And they'll get help from the people around them. Or they'll just use the hint on the card and be able to act. And so it creates this very fast feedback. More importantly, mo perhaps even most importantly, is that when we're playing a game, the act of playing gives us permission to behave differently than we might otherwise be in a meeting. I can explore an idea if I'm sitting with the most senior developers in the company who have founded it, built the code, they might say, this is safe. I might freeze. I might not feel like it's okay for me to tell these folks let's explore. But if I'm playing a game with them, I can say, yeah, it's, it probably is, but what about this, right? I just have to play my card in this hand, so let's see what happens. And that permission 
also extends to disagreement. If I'm going to have a disagreement with someone, no, we shouldn't look at that. Well, we're just playing a game, let's talk about it, and it doesn't matter all that much. Oh, maybe it does matter. Let's track it and do something about it. But the game gives me a different context for a conversation. And as security people, that can be incredibly powerful because we don't have a lot of playful conversations with the people around us. The other thing to mention about elevation of privilege is that it produces real threat models. It's not simply a training game that you play once and then you're done, you know how to threat model. As you said, it's been the core of your threat modeling work for two years. And so that's a valuable property of the game. Now, the game sits in, in a line of games. Uh, it was directly inspired by Protection Poker by Laurie Williams at North Carolina State. Um, I heard a podcast that Laurie was in talking about it, and I said, that's fun. Let me see if I can build a game to, to help people. And then I learned about this whole serious, uh, ga this whole serious games movement. And I said, huh, well, if threat modeling should be simple, fun, and have flow, I can build games for this. And I did this while I was at Microsoft, no longer there, um, but we Creative Commons licensed it, and it's on GitHub. If you go to GitHub, Adam Showstack, EOP, you can download copies, and we'll give you more links at the end of the presentation. But I do want to say thank you to Microsoft for enabling this open source sort of engagement where Mark can take the game, and I heard from him after he had built the, the privacy extension. So if you want to do similar things, um, it's worth thinking about serious games because this is a big field. It's got its own conferences, and a serious game is a game it, that has an explicit and defined educational purpose. The goal is not to play for pleasure, the goal, you can, but the, the goal is present. And there's all sorts of things, tabletop exercises, persuasive games, games for health. We see a lot of use of gamification, points, badges, leaderboards to help motivate people. And there's ups and downs to these things, which I'm not gonna go into, but I do wanna give a shout out to a colleague at Microsoft who used gamification to help deliver Windows 7. So Windows is shipped in, I don't even know, I think it's now 130 different languages. And QAing the translation from English into these other languages is a big expensive project. And so they gamified it. They said, what we're gonna do is present you the English text and the Hungarian text. And then they reached out to our office, to their office now in Hungary, and said, hey, all of your people should look at these screens and tell us where the translations are good and where they're bad. And it turns out that that work resulted in lower cost and better translation because of the use of a gamified structure. And so you can really think about games solving problems that you have around engagement, around how do I get lots of people to do an activity that they might not understand really well. You know, we don't want to just present them walls of text. And so I think serious games are important to security. And basically all that argumentation which Adam just presented is why I picked up um, this idea when we've been working with all the GDPR work in, that, in our company. And I'm also myself quite a heavy uh, board gamer, so obviously it also came quite naturally to adopt this feeling. But more on that later. Um, how did this whole idea came from specifically? So as most of the companies, we've been working on our GDPR prep work, which I assume everybody here is already done with and they close the project. <laughs> so towards the end of the deadline, um, we had a conversation that, okay, um, there's a specific article in GDPR about data protection 
by design and default. Um, and no one had any clue what that means. And we still don't really know. But it's an article in GDPR. You have to have some kind of documentation and evidence around it that you're doing it. So obviously what legal and compliance said, well, we are going to create a policy which requires all the developers to think about privacy when they are developing. Now, the reality obviously is that design decisions are usually made by either one developer when he's working on a story, or best case, he's asking a couple of colleagues to grab a coffee and discuss this uh, design decision he wants to do. So that's not the context where people start looking at specific items in a policy. So underlying this, I believe pretty deeply that mo all of the developers I've ever worked with want to ship quality code. And that quality now includes security and privacy. They understand that. They see the headlines. They're like, yes, this matters, but I'm not sure exactly what you want me to do. Please help me understand how I can do this in my sprints, in my process, and do so in a way that respects my time and my engagement. And so for me, there's huge value in making sure that the security and privacy requests that we make of people are accessible, understandable, and to the extent that we can make them fun, it's an, it's an all around win. So as Adam said, um, this whole privacy concept somehow had to get into the context where the developers are. <coughs> and what I was thinking of was that we already have this quite well established process around threat modeling. So we already have an area where developers knew that, okay, we are going to talk about threats. We are going to go through this with every feature. So it wasn't unexpected for them. So that's where the idea came, like, how could we put privacy into the threat modeling exercise? How could we leverage the same situation we are in um, to get the engineers insight into that topic? And here comes where it's relevant that I used to work a lot in user-centered design, that I learned there the hard way that whatever system or project you're working on, it's going to be way better quality if you cooperate with a couple of people, it's going to be awesome quality if you involve the end users of your solution very early. So there are a lot of methodologies and a lot of names for what this is. Um, User-centered design, uh, human-computer interaction, user experience, iterative design, whatever. I think the most important part out of this is that involve your end users um, and evolve them often and regularly. So calling out the four items that I think are important is understand the people your solution is going to work for, understand the use case where they are going to work with this system, and then quickly provide them something before you put like months of work into it, like sketch something on a piece of paper, show them how it's going to look, like have them interact with the piece of paper and see how that works out, and do also another uh, bunch of other types and methods for evaluation. Um, so the picture here, not necessarily saying that everyone has to go to that extreme, but a good example is we had a project where we wanted to equip firefighters and help them in extreme situations. So obviously we had a bunch of very good ideas. The mobile development team had a bunch of ideas how to create apps that they are going to use to look in the snow or smoke and uh, see their environment and also a bunch of other ideas. But because it was quite established in the team to work with the end users, they said, first of all, we are going to go into a firefighting exercise and see how that works. So the guys you see on the picture are not firefighters. Those are IT researchers who went to a firefighting exercise, put on all the equipment, and actually followed the firefighters following their process to understand how does this environment look like. And quite quickly, they realized, OK, all of the ideas we had, we can just throw them out. Like, you're not going to put any additional equipment on a firefighter. He's already carrying around the, uh, 20 kilos. I don't know what that's in American 45 units. 45 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, around. Um, he has gloves on. He doesn't see shit. Like, really, what kind of IT equipment are you going to give him? And an interesting 
result out of this whole exercise was, and I'm interested whether you come to the same conclusion. So what do you think the firefighters themselves said is the most important tool when they are going out to uh, an emergency situation? No, not the radio. Oxygen mask? Could also be a possibility, but no. Actually, they said a wedge. They usually have a couple of wedges with them, like wooden wedges, because it's an all-around tool. They can break things open. They can use it as a hammer. They can put it under things that they want to hold in place. So although it seems quite counterintuitive, because like a large wooden wedge has quite some weight, but they carry them around with themselves when they go into somewhere. So motivated by this, um, and these are old slides. <laughs> Um, so my requirement was, I want to integrate privacy into threat modeling. So how do I understand my users? How do I understand that environment we are going to work in? And fortunately, as I said, we were at the, uh, towards the end of our GDPR preparation. So we had a bunch of JIRA items which specifically called out engineering tasks which needed to be done for GDPR compliance. And in the threat modeling session, we have the engineers in there. So obviously, those JIRA items were something that they can understand. Additionally, we have around 15 products which we actively develop, so it wasn't too narrow of a set of requirements that I was able to look at, but like a huge portfolio depending on where the uh, specific product started, which culture, um, what kind of target audience it initially had. So there were a bunch of interesting items in there. Um, items uh, like this, which included like remove inactive profiles or anonymize IP addresses or implement a cleanup job which removes, um, what is that, uh, personal background images. So based on these JIRA items, I was basically able to compile a list of topics which uh, should be discussed during a privacy session. So the next question was, okay, so I'm going to move privacy into the strap modeling session, but how that, is that going to look like? like do we do the evaluation of privilege card game and then we switch to something else? Are we going to then look at the diagram and start pointing uh, out uh, things or go to a checklist or whatever? Um, obviously now, spoiler alert, it made sense to integrate privacy into uh, the card game itself. So how does that look to integrate it into the card game? Uh, first of all, we needed some cute icon, like the one with the monsters. That's also a fun experience, but that's not the important part of it. Um, but the hint texts, uh, hint texts, which are on the cards, are very good for the developers because looking into this flow model, they're not as detailed to actually turn them into a checklist and get developers bored that they just read the text and think that they're ticking boxes. But also they are not so abstract or so security specific that they can't relate to it. So the idea here was that in order to create texts or hints which are clear for developers, I created like small scenarios for all the topics that I've identified. So for example, one of the scenarios was that someone uses a restaurant recommendation app, um, which based on previous restaurants visits, compares it with like the restaurant persona, or what you want to call it, of other users, and identifies further restaurants which are worth visiting. And the privacy concern would be that additional to the restaurant persona, there's also a financial persona being created, which is then used to targeted advertising of jewelry or something like that. And the question was like, okay, how would an engineer describe this scenario? What text is understandable for him that it relates to this kind of situation? And I think you also wanted to add something about the hints here. Yeah, the, the thing that I wanted to mention is I'm, I'm glad that you saw that. We actually spent a huge amount of time working through and doing usability tests on the hints on the cards. We, we prototyped half a dozen different approaches and then watched how people engaged with them. And so it, it was exciting to me to hear that you actually did something similar as you were doing this work. The, and actually, if I can go for one more second, I want to go back to something you said, which is when you were talking about doing this work of really observing, you said go to the, you don't have to go to this extreme. And there I want to disagree a little bit. The, the genesis of this work 
was really engagement with the human beings we were asking to do threat modeling, really watching as they struggled with the tool and said, this is tedious, I'm not finding the right things, how do I make it better? And sitting and saying, okay, this is what really happens. And I think there are few substitutes and you know, I've never put on firefighter gear as part of this. I go into different meeting rooms and I'm like, I just wanna listen and see what's happening. Um, please, please just let me wallflower a little bit. Or I sit behind a glass wall and it never fails to surprise me how much I learn when I simply sit and observe and take notes about what's happening. Yeah. So final requirement. Um, so we are going to add privacy to the elevation of privileged card game. But as I said, like I compiled quite a large list. Like, are we going to work with all of these? How is that going to fit into the time? And also, as mentioned, most threatening sessions end because you run out of time. And you run out of time because although it's a known and uh, accepted process, you still have to convince the product manager that, hey, I'm now going to pick up all your development team and go into a room, um, have them do strap modeling instead of delivering them uh, your feature. So I had to find like, okay, what's the balance that we can extend that session without actually getting into the argument that, okay, we understand security is important, but could we like avoid the privacy part? So my magic number I came up with was like, okay, we could add like 20% to the session we could still argue that that's enough, but okay, then how are we going to get that huge list um, down to just needing 20% of time? And basically the statement behind that was, okay, let's um, have one suit dedicated to privacy. That means 11 items which we can have in there. So which 11 items? Um, I did two rounds of filtering. Uh, first round was just to get like, down to the 11 uh, using all the people who have been working with GDPR within the company, basically having each of them provide a ranking which they think is important. And then I used that 11 items, which I sent then to members of the International Association of Privacy Professionals, which small uh, commercial is quite as good as of us, um, and had them also do the same exercise, like rank these 11 items. So I got a final list of, okay, what is the most important? So what should be king? What should be the two? Um, fortunately, at that time, I was reading a book um, which talked a lot about how humans are really bad at ranking things. Like, you give the same list of items in the morning and in the afternoon, you'll get different results. Even so, that if you have duplicates in the list, people might not notice that they have put the one item in the top and the other on the bottom. So what I did to rationalize this a little bit was to look at the actual fines which have been um, given by different data protection authorities. And fortunately, like the French and the English are quite trigger happy, so there was plenty of <laughs> reference I could work from. And there were like some very interesting findings. So for example, um, privacy professionals thought that the situation that you have like a sub-processor who you send data to, and then at the end, of the contract, you ask them to, okay, let's please delete those items. Well, obviously by now we know that usually that's not how it works, but also there have been previous finds which uh, with situations where someone actually gave data to a third party, asked them later to delete it, and that data just stayed there. So that was one example where basically I had to reorder um, the card. So, to explain how, we, how Mark actually added privacy to, to the game, it's important to understand a little bit about Stride. And Stride is a mnemonic that has, actually this year will be the 20th anniversary of the creation of Stride as a way to help people think about what goes wrong. And so it's a mnemonic stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I say it a lot. Usually I say it more slowly. But these are, these are six types of things that typically go wrong with systems. And so if you're just thinking about what, what might go wrong, 
it's a helpful starting point. We use them as the suits in the card game. And then Mark extended that to be? Striped. So hopefully in 20 years, <laughs> we are still going to talk about this. Um, let's be ambitious. Um, but yeah, I think it's also very important here that, um, so I did think a lot about, okay, we already have striped. Are the items in the privacy extension not actually just manifestations of those? And specifically looking at the fines which have been given, like I tried to translate those into stride threats, but like very specifically, uh, your third party not deleting your data doesn't really translate into stride. So I think that having like the privacy part into this um, has value, and I really encourage everyone to also think about this when they're doing their straddling part. And to help you with that, this is where the game part comes, is that we are going to present three out of these cards. Obviously, if you want to know more about uh, the individual cards, you can look at the downloads. It's also Creative Commons. But what we are going to do now is we're going to go one card at a time, read you the scenario or the hint on the card, and the first person who can say like a good either real world or at least practical um, example of that situation is going to get one <laughs> of the deck of cards. So going first is three of privacy, which is your system is not able to properly handle withdrawal of consent or objection. Yes. So GDPR and future uh, California privacy law violation. Could you give a be scenario or an example of how that would look like? You're correct. A Just be more specific about yeah. where it would happen. You collected yeah. these <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, just to avoid that people standing up in the middle and coming forward, um, we'll give the cards at the end, but yeah, that's yes. a great example. So the seven of privacy, your system is not following through on personal data deletion in integrated third parties. That's why it's dangerous, You got your deck of cards. Absolutely. Who has a third mirror? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you get, if you find a Marriott scenario for this one, then um, I might figure out to get two decks. Um, but this is my favorite card, which is personal data in your system is missing pointers to the data subject. Hence, the data piece is forgotten when the owner of it asks for deletion or makes an access request. Um, that you were first. Yeah. That's well, a good well done, but you failed to tie it to a hotel chain. <laughs> 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 so, as af after Mark reached out and contacted me and we had submitted this talk, um, we heard from some folks at F-Secure who had done similar work. And so we wanted to give a shout out to them and make you aware of what they had done. They've also created a variant, um, Creative Commons licensed dish. And so to quote from their site, you can play with or without the original elevation of privilege, so a little bit of a different design. And they created a four, a four uh, letter mnemonic of, called TRIM, which is transport of personal data, retention and removal, inference of personal data from other personal data through correlation, which I think is a really interesting category to make some cards for and minimization of personal data and use. And so, personally, I'm excited that we see this um, explosion of people building new things on this frame. Um, yes, and with that, to sum up, so um, now you have basically three options. If you haven't tried the Elevation of Privilege card game before, or if you are just looking at security threats, then you can go on and get the original deck. Or um, if you want to add a little bit of privacy spice to your threat modeling, then um, go with the privacy extension of Striped. Or if you want to go full in privacy for a session, you can use the Elevation of Privacy game. Someone else wants to take a picture? But and the slides will be available, of course. And the, the link in text on the next slide. So. We want to encourage you to go out and try this. Try threat modeling. Try threat modeling with privacy. 
You can get the card deck. There are free versions that you can print yourself at, um, either at GitHub, LogMeIn, or F-Secure. Or there's a company in the UK, Agile Stationery, who are making them available for sale. And so you can get one that's printed up nicely with rounded corners in a box, and so it looks a bit nicer. And someone said to me the other day, you know, I saw that, it looks a little expensive. I think it was 20 pounds. And it, in a sense, it is a little bit more expensive than a standard deck of cards, which they print by the millions. But if you're in a room full of developers, then this is by far the cheapest thing in the room, <laughs> even. And so you can get a copy there, and they, they said they were going to tweet some links and some discount codes right after our talk, so maybe that will happen. And so with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Mark, for creating and driving this. Thank you for the possibility to be here. And we're happy to take any questions you have. Go. Yeah, we'll repeat the question. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, so, All right, so um, everything in my head says that gamifying threat modeling would be very productive, especially for the many different angles and, and benefits that the both of you described. I have a mental block to the idea that uh, I could play a game in a meeting. Um, mm. How do I get over that? So, so that's actually a great question. Thank you. And what I usually do is I ask people to give me 15 minutes and suspend their sense of disbelief. <laughs> and give it, so I will ask you, give it 15 minutes. If it's not working, um, sorry it didn't work for you, but as an experiment, it's an inexpensive experiment to run. And I, you know, I do training work a lot, and I sometimes use the game when I'm training people who are not security people. And every time I hand it out, I have this moment of trepidation that this is just gonna be a group for whatever reason that it doesn't work, and it always works. I mean, you could juxtapose the alternative. You could juxtapose the alternative and say, instead of the one hour e-learning that I was forcing the developers to look at this year, <laughs> we might try this alternative approach. So I, I like it, so yes, but again, it's, it's, entice, it's designed to pull people in, suspend your disbelief for a few minutes and it will work for you. All right, well, we are now standing between. I've got a question. Oh yeah, please. So um, <laughs> when actually running this game, right, um, as the AppSec person, do you act more as a moderator and kind of help usher along ideas? Or do you participate in the game as well? So I try and read, it's a, another good question. I try and read the room of, do I have people who need some coaching and help? Or do I have people who will be engaged by the act of competition and trying to beat the game's creator? Um, and so I will adjust my game style from collaborative to cutthroat as, as is appropriate. <laughs> I personally prefer doing it collaboratively. I think that that brings out a great deal of innovation, right? People get excited. What about this? How about that? What, what, blah, 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 and it, it just flows out of them, and it's lovely to see. And so I try to act on the coach side, but occasionally you get people who are like, no, we're going we're gonna to beat you here. <laughs> so also, I've got, I've got a um, follow-up, too. A uh, moment to add to sure. that. that um, so in the beginning, uh, sometimes developers ask why I didn't uh, uh, hand out cards for myself. And I think it's a good also like indication to them saying that this session is not about the security engineer telling what's the problem with their system. This is about them looking at it, and I can help them um, in this process, but they don't have the feeling that, okay, the responsibility is on me to point out the problems. Right. So we know this game is not about points, right? But it also is. Um, so when running one of these games, right, we want to bring out problems, tease out the problems. <clears throat> so. There's a lot of unknowns in any software system, 
and people may not be sure if there is a vulnerability here. So do you assign some kind of score or partial score based on that because they need to maybe investigate something? Do you record that as, some, as a need? You do record it, but not... Okay. No, you record it, you give them points because what you're encouraging is the exploration of the system. If it turns out that, it was, that a threat was predicated on a faulty assumption and they got a point for it, is that okay so it doesn't turn into something real? But we've rewarded the behavior that we want to see, which is thinking about what are we working on, what can go wrong, what are we going to do about it? Uh, so my question actually dovetails into that really well. So that where that third question where you say, what are we going to do about that? That's not part of the game, is it? No. Yeah. So, okay. so the, the, the link between the game and that is the appoint a note taker. Make a list of what you learn, and then you can go and file bugs. You can write use cases, acceptance tests, all of the things that integrate back into the development process. Teaching them um, to enumerate the list of things that can go wrong, which is, that, I mean, as security people, one of the things that people often say is developers are not good at reverse engineering, right? They're good at building a solution, but they don't have the, the hacker mind to take a system and kind of invert it and understand what can go wrong. So, I mean, that's a very, very valuable outcome of the exercise. Thank you. And maybe the most valuable outcome of the exercise, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And with that, we just got the uh, orange whips all around. Um, and so we now stand between you and lunch and hate to do that. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.